screen and uh, got it. Um, and um, if anybody has problems, you should immediately, uh, I'm, I'll watch to see, I'm not gonna watch the chat, but I can see if things go into the chat, which might alert me that something's wrong. Um, so let me share my screen. That's right, yes. Can you all see that? Yep. Okay. Um, let me move this over. I can move. Yeah. All right. I'm trying to move some bars around so that I've got a full view of what I know you can see. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so, um, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming. I really am happy to be here and to talk to you today about both some many things that we seem to know about crows these days, and also some of the work that my group has done. So let me, um, I'm going to be going fairly fast through a bunch of uh, information on crow life history, which I know everybody wants to hear about. And please um, stick check questions in the chat for later, or um, I hopefully will have time. Now, let me make sure that I can, hmm. Wait, 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 there we go. Okay, I'm finding this one moment. I need to rearrange something here. There we go. My, uh, hmm. I'm having some trouble advancing slides. It advanced and then did not advance. There we go. Okay, very good. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a bit of overview of what I want to talk about today. Um, and first, I'm going to tell you a little about, a bit about crows per se. Who are crows as a group, and why should anybody want to study them? Then we'll run through a bunch on American crows and their family lives. Um, and then I want to address this idea of crows moving into urban areas and ask some questions about how city crows might have changed or if they've changed. And we'll also look at whether cities are healthy for crows. That question is a big one and we've got lots more to do. And then finally, I want to end on a note of um, crows of the world and conserving them. Crows are... Um, very adaptable as I'll argue and socially complex and wonderful animals, but are they really okay in this world? For us, American crows are everywhere. That's not perhaps all true, they're everywhere. So the first thing I wanna bring up is crows are diverse. It's a huge group. We know of a few birds here in the Northeast. We know of American crows, we know of ravens. They're close, co uh, close relatives of the crows, belong to the same genus. Um, and we have fish crows. I don't know whether you people up there in Rochester are getting a few fish crows here and there. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the crows of the world. We have at least 46 species. I'll argue that we certainly have 47. Um, we just lost a species recently, by the way. New Northwestern crows were reclassified as American crows. So I'm had 46 on here. <clears throat> but among and one of the things I want to point out is that we have no idea actually how many different crow species we have in some areas. But we have at least 46 species. Basically, they're all big black birds. Some have some white or gray on them. They're passerines, they're perching birds, like your sparrows and robins. Many species are found on only one island, um, New Caledonian crows, Mariana crows. I'll talk a little bit about those. And only some of them live in close association with humans. If you think about crow diversity, as I say, they're all pretty much big black birds of varyingly very large to moderately large. Um, but if you look at them up close and personal, what you begin to see is that one of the ways in which the crow species differ is in their bills. And these are pretty amazing in some cases. These look 
if you look closely, you'll see how different they are in their curvature. And you can say, what, why is this one so curved? Why is this one so straight? What are they doing with those bills that's so different? Here's one to stop you, Corvus crassirostris or the thick-billed crow. Um, this, we actually have absolutely no idea what its really purpose of that large bill is. There are a number of possibilities. Um, and here are some more. There's two on the left that are classified as the same species, but you can appreciate how very different those two bills are. So these are one way that crows interact with their world through their diets and um, possibly through sexual displays. And it gives us some idea of that the diversity of crows is much greater than just being a bunch of big black birds. So why would anyone study crows? Well, one of the reasons that's, that people study crows currently, um, a very compelling reason for some people is that they've been called feathered apes. They've revealed themselves to be app learners. They're good at problem solving. Some are tool users, I'll tell you in a minute. And they have very complicated social lives. And yet they are no way related to primates. They're, they're, very, they're like a completely different uh, development of this um, highly cognitive, smart group of, bird, of, of animals. So they make good comparisons in some ways with the apes. One of the best known for these smarts is the New Caledonian crow. This is when people say, oh, crows use tools. This is the crow they're talking about. It's found on the small island of New Caledonia, which is in the Pacific. It's um, <laughs> near in quotes to New Zealand. It's a good, a good long plane ride from New Zealand, but it's sitting in the middle of the Pacific. That's the only place it lives. Um, that and a little tiny island of Mare that's right next to it. They eat grubs and other hidden prey. They have no woodpeckers on that island, so they are the only animals that have that uh, can get to the grubs. And they've evolved um, abilities, amazing abilities, to make hook and leaf tools out of the pandanus leaf, which has little hooks on it. They insert them into cavities, and the grubs that are in these cavities grab onto these hooks, and then they pull them out and eat them. So this is a major source of protein for them. And even more amazing is actually when you start to look closely at the bird itself. Below is our familiar American crow. Above is a head of the New Caledonian crow. Look at that bill. That bill above is basically a pair of blunt-nosed pliers meant to hold those tools that they can used to stick down into holes. So not only has that bird evolved a large, it's actually slightly larger than some of our other crows, it has forward facing eyes to be able to dexterously work with those tools and a bill designed to hold tools in a way that no American crow could, could actually do. So that gives you some of the idea of some of the fascinating things that you can discover. Here's one species on one small island. And here's just a bunch of papers which recognize that people have been working with a variety of other crow species, jackdaws, Japanese crows, um, or carry and carrion crows. Um, new, uh, the New Caledonian crow is the one that we were just talking about, ravens and discovering all sorts of ways in which they're excellent problem solvers and invent their own solutions in the wild. The other reason that people are increasingly interested in crows and a number of other birds is that they are good urban adapters. A number of the species, quite a few species have become very close inhabitants of our cities living right with us. And sometimes if you look up Japanese crows, you'll find that the, um, some of the um, Japanese crows are actually considered incredible nuisances in cities. But as a scientist, we're interested in the traits that allow animals and other organisms to adapt to our increasingly urban world, something that we can use to think about when we design our cities or to think about how our cities are being good or bad for us. 
And in this urbanizing world, scientists um, have been turning to birds for understanding how animals adapt or do not adapt to living in our cities, including things like adjusting their vocalizations to be higher than the traffic. And so we can add crows to that list as successful adapters. So what do you need to adapt to an urban lifestyle? Well, when we're talking about vertebrates, particularly warm-blooded vertebrates like mammals and birds, we often think about um, what sorts of behavioral traits, ecological traits would make them good. And the adapters, as opposed to the avoiders or the pigeons or the exploiters and pigeons, um, we generally think they start with a broad diet and are pretty good at finding a broad set of nest sites, accepting a broad set of nest sites, that they're flexible, innovative, they can learn from others, maybe that speeds their adaptations, and maybe they have a bold personality. Um, in the case of evolutionary potential, sources of variation in enough time, well, crows are long lived, they haven't had a lot of time. And so now I wanna to turn to the American crow as an, uh, a bird in its own right and as an ad urban adapter. American crows start off with being incredibly broad in their range. So they're spread all across North America, stopping short of, short of deserts in the, in the lower Southwest and breeding up through Canada. So right away, you know that they're in some sense a generalist and probably have a broad diet and broadly adaptive abilities. And indeed, when you look at what crows are doing, you know perfectly well, they're also quite innovative. They're great at getting in our garbage. They learn garbage day. Um, they open all sorts of things with their bills. And in actual fact, some like John Marsliff out at the University of Washington have argued that they're a long been a synanthropic species. That is a species that lives with people, um, perhaps following tribal peoples and using their garbage and um, hunting refuse. But they've only recently actually become adapters to our urban areas. Urban living really is recent. 60s and early 70s are really the first reports people have of crows being, of actually uh, breeding in the city. And as you can see from this graph, from the breeding bird survey, after they moved into cities, they clearly expanded in their numbers. It was a good new niche for them. This is data from my colleague, at Kevin McGowan at the Laboratory of Ornithology. Um, in which he recorded the presence of American crows in his small town, his then somewhat small town of urban uh, Springfield, Ohio. He went back every December for Christmas. And here you can see that pattern. They seeing them a little bit in the early 70s and suddenly they expand through the 80s and 90s to be constant presence. So why would urban, uh, why would American crows move into urban areas? Well, we think it may have to do with, first of all, stable resources. Humans leave trash around all year round, and it's better than trying to find it through the snow or out in the fields. So it's more stable. Um, we make dumps. That's another place that crows congregate in the winter. Another almost certain big one is there was no hunting in the city. At the time that crows moved in, they may have been becoming more less afraid of people because they were included in the breeding, in the uh, Migratory Bird Act, which at that point, uh, which then restricted their hunting to specific seasons rather than allowing them to be hunt, hunted on site. But there's a never, there wasn't hunting in the season in the city. So if they were willing to move in, they would certainly find a hunter free environment. And finally, at the time they were moving in, there were probably many fewer predators, particularly the large um, hawks and owls that prey on them and their nestlings. So our Ithaca crow project, our Ithaca research project, has actually followed individually marked crows in Ithaca, New York for about 50% of the time that crows have lived in cities. Um, if we start in the 60s and 70s, Kevin began the project 
Banding Crows in 1989. And I joined in about 2000, 2001 with my students. And this year may be our last year of banding, but it will be our 34th year of banding crows and following crows. And this research group, I will talk about crows as having large groups. It had, our research group has required a lot of people and this is not all of my current ones. Why don't more people study crows? Well, crows are a <laughs> challenging subject, it turns out. They don't like to be caught and marked and trapping adults is extremely hard because they're very, very wary. Now I said that maybe a bold personality would get you into the city. We'll get you get back on that. But crows are excellent at noticing any changes in their environment. These crows have been uh, foraging in front of that net for the last week and a half, two weeks. We changed just a little something because we're gonna shoot that net out of over them and they've noticed the change, a very tiny change. So instead we do most of our bird marking by going finding the nests, which is itself not all that easy. But once we've found a nest, the inhabitants of the nest can't fly away and they don't know enough to uh, be really scared of us. So these are the eggs, um, typical clutch size of five, babies, very young babies. Um, the nestlings on the lower left are about the age we like to band them. And on the right is a baby who's getting just a little old and he's looking at this, uh, giving the hairy eyeball to the person who's up there. Your problems still aren't solved. These crows are high in trees. We have to climb to get them. And here's some pictures of where those nests are and how we get there. We use the ladder, the 30 foot ladder as much as we can, but some of them are way in excess of a 30 foot ladder. And once we get up to the nest, we put them in a large bucket. Can you see my cursor? Anybody see my cursor? Yeah, good. Um, we can put them in that bucket. Whoop. Got it. Come on guys, there we go. And um, bring them down. We weigh, this might be the only time we have them in hand. We do everything we can think of. We weigh them, we measure them. We put tags on them. We put bands on them. We take samples, we take blood samples because that's the best way to sex a crow. Um, and then we put them back in the bucket, take them back up, stick them back in their nests. And that might be the last time we'll ever have that bird in hand. And all of this is just so that we can recognize individual crows. And it makes you very um, humble in some ways to realize that you have to put on bands and tags on a crow to recognize it, where they learn very readily to recognize us as individuals. So let's talk about crows and their, and their typical uh, lifestyles. They're cooperative breeders in the Northeast. Not all of their range do they um, cooperatively breed. In some parts of their range, this means they have only just pairs that raise their own families and then everybody goes their own way. But in our area, um, they're cooperative breeders, which means that they retain their young often for a year or more who stay at home rather than taking off on their own as soon as they're independent. And many times those individuals will help their parents with rearing the next year's young. They also will join other families. We have some young birds who will join a family that is not theirs and be a helper in their families. So the picture on the, if I can get my, there we go. The picture on the left um, shows you two young birds, the tag birds, UK and QO, and they're looking down at new nestlings in their parents' nests. And QO in particular that year, it was a very exposed nest, would actually stand over the nest and shield them from the sun. And her mother would reach over and preen her. It was really cute. So cooperative breeders, crows are not the only cooperative breeders in the world. It's been claimed that we are, which is a good reasonable claim, but the typical cooperative breeders are slow to mature. The offspring remain with the family, sometimes well after maturity, and that happens in our crows. And the um, 
the offspring that remain often, not always, but often as individuals choose to be helpers in baby rearing and other tasks. For young crows, this means that they feed the young, they feed the female on the nest, they act as sentinels around the nest, and when the family is foraging, they defend the territory. And once out of the nest, the nestlings or the fledglings then are often very, very um, apt to follow their older um, non-parents, older siblings, um, and rush after them and orient to anything that they might be eating. It's just possible that cooperative breeders actually benefit in another way from being cooperative breeders and having this age graded, age diverse group. Because when, in studies that we've done of young crows by my um, student, former student, uh, um, Dr. Campbell Smith, um, it's the fledglings, the very young crows who know very little, who go around and pick up all sorts of non-food items. Adults will never pay any attention to something that they don't think is food. Although the young crows who pick up those objects spend very little time with them, they seem to be sort of ADHD. They'll pick it up, drop it, pick it up, drop it. It's then, then the yearlings and the subadults, these medium age helpers who will often take notice and then go over and spend a considerable amount of time actually investigating it. So there's the possibility that these different ages in the family actually facilitate discovery. Crows basically um, in their groups are very caring. You see alloprening, that is preening another bird as you see over here on the left. Um, they play as sentinels down here on the lower right for while, when others are foraging, there's almost always a bird up watching in the family. And in this, and some cases, they even feed sick individuals. This was one that Kevin captured on record. Um, this was the sick female with an eye disease. The male was feeding at a nest and he stopped by and quickly slipped her some food on the way. Furthermore, they are somewhat slow to mature and they can live a long time, another typical aspect of cooperative breeders. Um, we have old crows, three males who live to 19, and M.P. Jessup, the female here, who also lived to 19 and was actually breeding um, in the year that she apparently died. Off territory, territor uh, crows leave um, leave their territories frequently and go off territory where they can often roost together, including in these huge winter roosts that you may have heard about, or forage together at communal areas that are particularly rich in food. So they have a very tiered social structure where they get to know birds way beyond their territories. And off those territories, they can sometimes have big scuffles and fights. Some of those are almost certainly serious. So one of the questions one could ask is, in a situation like this, where you're staying home past maturity many times in your family, how do you become a breeder in this complex social structure? First of all, we know here, as shown here, both males and females become mature enough to breed at about age two. But in actual fact, females don't normally breed until they're between three and four. They don't become a breeder on a territory. And males often delay until they're close to five and onwards. So this suggests that there might be just a little bit of tension in some of those families or a tension at least of trying to find a breeding position. Here you've got mature birds who are essentially waiting to breed. So here's a diagram that tries to show you some of the ways that males and females differ and how they do to become, whoops, sorry about that again. It's, there we go. For males, they have a number of different routes. They can inherit the territory as shown in the darker blue from an older breeder older male breeder, often their father. They can also bud, which is to take 
um, a section of land which overlaps some of their family territory and um, adds to it. And sometimes their parents will help them hold that territory. They can also replace a breeder who has died. And um, in a very minority of cases, they actually take off and make a new territory with a new mate. So it gives you some sense that maybe space is also a little bit limited. For the females, the story is rather different. The, by far the largest number of females are actually replacements. A female has died because she's been killed on the nest and she and a younger female moves in and replaces her. So as you can imagine with these families composed of some mature but not breeding birds, there's also not just cooperation but competition. And we've used paternity tests to look for the um, competition in the form of illicit mating, shall we say, between the female and some other than her mate. And we've looked at this, um, done paternity, oops, again, analyses, and about 10% of the um, nestlings in the study that, was, that we did in that particular period were actually fathered by a male outside the mate, uh, a male other than the female's mate who came from outside the territory. Another 6.5% were by sons of the male who mated with a new, a stepmother. And rather surprising to us, there were two males, two young males who actually mated with their own mothers and produced broods through incestuous relationships. All of these things, incestuous relationships, males who don't move far away, who bud from their territories, would, might suggest to you that one of the problems that um, birds might, or crows might have in an urban area is inbreeding. And if you look at crows in urban areas, they do show quite a number of possible diseases that could be um, affected by inbreeding and a lack of immune resistance. This nestling over here is actually, oops, sorry about that. I'm trying to move my cursor and I can't see it all the time. Um, the nestling on the lower left is actually just fine, but is probably does reflect inbreeding. We had a series of broods from one pair where the nestlings would all come out naked, essentially, except for their primaries, their wing feathers and their tail feathers. And then they got them afterwards. They, after they went through a molt, they got their normal feathers. But these others are um, infections in the legs and um, pox. And the study that we did, we did find, um, Andrea Townsend, a, a graduate student did this, uh, found that there was more mortality, more disease mortality in birds that were more inbred. Another kind of competition is obviously overt competition, fights for territory and females. So I'll just tell, give you a quick example. This is in the upper left is XX who moved um, to a new territory from his parents' territory at the ripe old age of 10. Things had been a little tense with his father for some years. He moved off and was joined by a brother, a younger brother um, who was only four at the time. And the next year after they attempted one year of breeding, they did not raise any offspring. And the next year I was called out to, about a big fight between crows and discovered XX and 8R, his younger brother, having an incredible battle that lasted 20 or 30 minutes in this driveway. And it, you can just um, take a quick look closely and you see how important their feet are in the fights, they're over, they roll over and over and over, clutching each other with their feet. The fight only stopped when another family of crows, hearing all the kerfuffle, came in from the side and gave a few calls. And then suddenly they were a cooperative family again and everybody flew after the intruders. But six days later, 
and there may have been more fights. Six days later, XX was all alone, looking very bedraggled, head uh, feathers all um, scruffed up. Uh, the female stayed with his younger brother, Adar, and shortly thereafter, XX disappeared. Our final story on that is that sometimes competition leads to murder. And we've been having people joke about murders of crows just long enough. And since suddenly one year we have two, and I will tell you this story briefly. So Zero O, Jewel, this is full name, what hatched in 2003. He was a helper with his brother and then tried to set up a territory next door and had another big fight with a male that came in to, um, to uh, take, take the female and the territory. He lost that fight, went back to his brother and had a leg injury that caused him to actually lose the foot. It healed, he was doing okay. He took a new territory the next year, attracted a mate. And that year was joined by a nephew from his original territory, a nephew he had helped to rear. And then the ne later that next that year that the male joined, I was called um, by the sheriff's office for a, a dead crow in their yard. Uh, oh God, this is not good. And went out and sure enough, it was zero O dead on the ground, not eaten, nobody, had, this was not a predator. And you look at his head and his head was just covered with um, peck marks from another crow. This just shows you that his foot was fine, nicely healed, but his head is horrible. And sure enough, um, DL was with the female and proceeded to try to breed. So I think that really shows you they're fighting uh, animals that were, or the crows that were missing a leg were at a severe disadvantage. And we had another crow that same year also killed who also had miss, been missing a leg. But that underlines the fact that these families, these cooperative breeders, it's a balance of cooperation and competition. And when you are really at the bottom line trying to breed, there's going to be um, these events. So now I want to talk, switch gears a little bit and ask a, um, the larger question of have city crows, those are what I just have been telling you about is crows being normal. So our question here is have city crows changed their behavior in any way? Are they different than rural crows? Well, We've discovered a number of ways in which our crows probably have changed. In one case, we're studying mobbing. And crow mobbing with, of predators is normally um, a whole family, even neighborhood affair in which uh, crows will start calling at a predator, bring in others, and pretty soon you've got a huge group attacking, chasing, et cetera. And you can only imagine that this is really, really intense when the predator is going after a nest. Some years ago, um, 30, 30 some years ago, it's right out of under, uh, Knight actually did a study in which he looked at the way urban crows had changed their responses to human nest intruders. That is people going up to nest trees and starting to climb up the tree. And at that time, he he found that the rural crows called much sooner, as soon as a person was in the general vicinity of a nest tree. But when the person got close to the tree, they quickly left and stayed gun range away. While the urban crows waited, were not particularly upset about people until they came very close to the tree. And then the crows came close and actually, the urban crows came close and actually dove at the intruder. And clearly he attributed this to the fact that urban crows can pretty much rely on nobody hunting them as adults. They're only, we're only a problem to their nestlings. Whereas the rural crows were saying, oh, hunters are a potential threat to the adults. So every year from 1990 until present, as we've climbed to nests, we've 
uh, recorded the number of mobbers that go after the climber. They normally do not hit you, they swirl around, but they can bring in families from a number of territories around until you can get like 40 or 50 crows, sometimes yelling and screaming at this person who's climbing to their nest. And then more recently, we totted up this number of mobbers across the years because we had this sense that suddenly we weren't getting as many mobbers. We replicated Knight's results. We certainly had more mobbing by more crows when we were climbing at an urban nest than the few rural nests where we climbed. But we saw something really surprising in when we started to look at it across time. Sure enough, somewhere in around 2007, mobbing, the number of mobbers at a nest had dropped off precipitously. And we were no longer seeing as many crows. We looked at it more carefully. What we discovered, if you can, I can show you, just basically look at this last bar. What you see is that the more recent climbs to nests, often nobody mobbed. Nobody was yelling at us and swooping at us. And very, very, very few were made of those mobbing groups were made up of large numbers. And in fact, that is what we had uh, experienced. We would go start to go up to a nest and I would say, what's wrong? There must be something wrong with the nest. I don't see any crows here. And then one of the birds that we knew would come in, would give a couple of rather disgusted alarm calls and then stop a few trees away and just sit there while we would do the rest of the climbing. So what's going on? What changed? We, you know, we're trying to figure out, um, is this because they had this sort of, we've been feeding them peanuts and then suddenly we start up to their nest and they have a kind of a, a sense of dissonance and they can't quite figure it out. And so perhaps this individual learning about our feeding of peanuts and the fact that we return the nestlings each time, people would think, well, maybe, you know, maybe they learn you're not so bad. But in fact, MP, that oldest crow that we had, she loved peanuts, but every year that we climbed to her nest over 14 years, she mobbed us. So that kind of individual learning is probably unlikely. It's, it is possible that when you grow up in a family that almost never alarms at peanut tossing people, um, that you are surprised and your response is very suppressed. I don't think we can get I don't think we can put that away. But I think one other thing needs to be thought about. Mobbing carries a cost. Mobbing essentially says, help, help. I have a nest and it's being attacked. And the nest is right here, right here where I'm yelling. Somebody is going after my nest. So it's visible advertisement that can be heard by others. And others include other predators. And indeed, one of the things that's happened over these years is that we've seen following the crows moving into town, an influx of large predatory birds, red-tailed hawks, owls, and um, the like. And so I would argue that it's quite possible that we have some component of a cultural shift in terms of being less anti-human, but it's also quite possible that this reflects their old, well-adapted ability to adjust to the presence of predators and to shut down their yelling at a nest when they're not sure that that's the worst thing that will happen, but they know that there's red-tailed hawks in the area. So this raises one other question um, about city crows. People have expected animals in the city to either become bolder or to have the boldest individuals move into the city. And so we've been interested to see whether or not our crows have actually changed, whether there's a contrast between urban and rural crows. And when typically when, um, so I, let me just, yeah. So this is, this is a picture of one of the ways we interact with crows. Here's me in a car. Um, setting up an experiment and using peanuts working with crows at the side of the road and you can see that they're um, clearly you might say they've gotten bolder if i do that with my rural crows they won't do it but 
there's an issue here. When you want to test whether or not an animal is bold, the typical way to go about it is to introduce a novel object besides some food that they're used to going, going to um, and to test for what we call neophobia. The very typical novel object is something that people choose to be weird and uh, a rubber ducky is, is not an unusual kind of novel object, plastic, bright colored, etc. And my, um, one of our thoughts on this, however, is that urban crows may not see a rubber ducky, but they've seen a heck of a lot of bright colored plastic objects, particularly if they live in a yard with small children. And my student, David Kalushi, is doing a variety of tests looking at behavioral differences. And one of his um, tests um, plays on this idea of it's really only novel if you haven't seen it before. So maybe we're often testing rural versus urban crows with objects which are intrinsically more familiar to urban ones than they could possibly be to rural ones. So we're not looking at intrinsic neophobia, we're looking at animals that are sort of familiar with bright yellow plastic versus animals that are not. So he set up an experiment in which the middle two, rather than using the novel objects on the left, he's using objects like this carton, this snack carton and an ear of corn where the snack carton for an urban bird is very familiar. An ear of corn at the side of the road might not be so familiar. Vice versa in the rural environment, an ear of corn off a truck at the side of the road is probably more familiar than an intact snack carton. And then his very novel object is again, trying to stay away from plastic and just be novel in terms of tall and, and bulky. So he put these out near food in rural and um, urban areas and indeed, this is just a ranking of the way the birds responded. He could show that looking at the same object, it was ranked differently by the urban and rural crows. And so rural crows might've been slightly less bold about all of this setup, but they were generally showing that if it was fairly, if it was somewhat familiar, they would react to it as familiar. Um, and you could reverse um, the who was more afraid simply by using something that was more or less familiar. So we think a lot of the boldness differences really have to do with experiences. And then the last um, thing I want to tell you about our crows is, the, is a problem that we think is large for many animals in cities. How healthy is it for crows living in a city? They live they, using our, their garbage, our, gar our garbage and eating um, our leftover foods. And Rebecca Heiss, uh, way back when with my master's student and did a study on this in which she looked carefully at the effects of um, uh, urban diets on urban crows and rural diets on rural crows. So the question she asked is what could there be as a downside? And of course, nutrients are a big one. They should be feeding their babies grubs and high protein, high quality items. So she compared urban and rural nestlings in their growth and also in health measures, measuring protein in their blood and calcium in their blood. And what we found was that urban crows have fewer nestlings in a single nest, smaller nestlings, and those nestlings have less calcium in their, serum pro, in their serum blood and less protein in their serum. And the calcium was particularly low actually on golf courses. So one question is why would crows choose fast food? Well, this is, I'm sorry, this is a sort of insert slide. This is just other evidence of nutritional stress, not the white feet as it turns out, but these uh, wing feathers showing white Poor, poor pigmentation, poor feather quality are also probably indicators of nu nutritional stress, stress. So why would crows choose a bad diet for their nestlings? 
Well, we think it has to do with a concept called ecological trap, where you, where you make something look natural and familiar. And in fact, it is inadequate to that animal's needs. So what can feed um, an, an adult may not be good for a nestling and adults may settle in an area like this golf course without realizing that the golf course is rolled and, and uh, pesticided and whatnot. And they're choosing foods then that are, or can't find enough food for their nestlings. Instead, the adults uh, turn to um, using foods that, well, like pizza and Pepsi is not exactly a good diet for anybody, but particularly not for nestlings. This is actually what, among other things that crows should be eating. And maybe if we planted more and made our, our cities truly natural, we would support more animals in better health. These are beech mast, beech nuts, and crows are actually adapted, well-adapted uh, spreaders of oak and beeches. So in the last about three minutes, or maybe so, I wanna tell you just one last message. This has to do with conservation. I think many people are used to thinking of crows as incredibly numerous, spread all over the place. I mean, really, and, and furthermore, I've just argued that they're adaptable, clever, they're smart about getting into new foods, even if they can't recognize the best foods. Should our crows really ever a con conservation issue? Furthermore, with all this diversity of crows that we have out there from a scientific point of view, they're really a gold mine of possible comparisons where you can look at different social grouping patterns. You can look at learning and cultures like in the um, New Caledonian crows. We can look at the um, ecological setting and the social setting for being a tool user or, or, or um, spreading social information and of learning why they can be adaptable to humans. What do we know about crows of the world? Well, it turns out that we know precious little. These are 36% um, of the species of crows that we know of have zero studies of any sort of behavioral field study within now close to 20 years, last 20 years. 19% have only one or two. That basically says over half of the crows of the world, we don't know anything about them. And we, that includes, we don't know anything about their populations. Are they nearly disappeared? Are there any left? Have they been impacted by habitat destruction? What's going on? Among them is the Hawaiian crow, which actually went extinct in the wild without a good behavioral study of what it was doing in the wild. And we are now reintroducing those crows into Hawaii successfully, but we have no idea what their natural social system should be. So my students are themselves studying not just American crows, but a variety of crows. Um, this is Connor Loomis who's studying the fish crows, which have been moving up from the southeast for over the last hundred years, are well established in Ithaca and are making their way. Um, you, somebody can tell me later if they're up in Rochester. I know they've been recorded up there by people observing them. These are the crows that make, instead of caw caw, they go ah, ah, ah. And his, it turns out that almost nothing is known about their social system. Their flock livers, they uh, peel off as pairs temporarily to breed and hold a little territory for breeding. And then once the kids can fly, back they go into these flocks. I think of them as sort of gypsies or Roma. You know, the, they travel together. They are um, incredibly um, social when they're a, in their little flocks. I'm used to seeing social behavior in American crows really only on their territories, not at big communal areas. So Connor is actually adding to our knowledge of crows that are not endangered, but are surprisingly little known. 
my student Andrea Croner, who's going to defend her dissertation tomorrow, has been studying the critically endangered Mariana crow, which in a tiny island of Rhoda is the only place this crow lives. There's only 200 left in the world, maybe. And the, they used to live on Guam. Some of you may know the story of the Guam um, invasion, the Guam destruction from the brown tree snake when it as an invasive species, which has destroyed most of the uh, ground living birds and many of the um, tree nesting birds. So there's no more of the aga on Guam. They're only on this tiny island of Rhoda and there's less than two, or there's only about 200, hopefully increasing population. Andrea has been documenting their calls, which no one has documented. And we're in danger of losing yet another species with almost nothing um, really substantial recorded about um, their social and communication systems. And lastly, just to point out another big problem, this is the ostensibly the range of one species, the jungle crow, which you may notice is uh, spread most of India, China, up through into Russia, um, and across all kinds of islands, the Philippines, Jakarta, um, Indonesia, and the island of Japan. And ostensibly, that's only one species, which is listed of no concern because it's so widespread. I've just told you about a whole bunch of crows that are on tiny islands that are very distinctive in everything they do. My student, Aubrey Alamsha is studying this species in one area of Thailand where it appears that that particular subspecies is extremely distinct, possibly as a separate species. But we suspect that in a case like this, that there are many species, completely distinctive crows hidden on these islands. So what I say is 46 or more different species of crows. Well, let's have more kinds of crows. Let's find more species among something like the um, jungle crows that are supposedly all one. And then I'm just ending this last slide because I have uh, been um, in contact with a number of people and I say this encouraging everybody out there to make observations tell people about what they observe in crows. June Hunter and um, Candace Savage, top and bottom, have both uh, written books recently. Neither one is a professional scientist by any means. They're great crow observers. They're photographers. They're uh, recorders. Uh, June Hunter is coming out with a, a new book. Um, it's out now. You can buy it at junehunter.com. Um, I suggested this. They did not ask me to do this, by the way. And Candace Savage has been consulting with me and a number of other crow researchers to uh, produce a fictionalized story of one female American crow, which is built on the lives of real crows and has all kinds of educational kid things you can do with your kids to learn more about it. And then I just want to note that Dr. Kaylee Swift has a great blog on crows for those of you who are interested. And with that, I thank you and all our uh, all my collaborators and um, all of the funders over the years. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ann. That was a great presentation. I learned a lot about these birds that I love. Are you able to see the chat or should I? No, I can, I can open up the chat and see it. Okay. And I see John, just as I'm going down there, John Janecki says, yes, fish, fish crows are in Rochester. And what we wanna know is, are they breeding? That's what we need to, I, I look for fish crows. Fish crows are smaller than American crows. They're, so they're about two thirds the size of an American crow, but crows are you know, individually variable in size and it is so hard to tell them apart. And so I know that when people put fish crows into something like eBird, which is where they record birds that they've seen, it's because they heard the bird say something. And that distinctive, ah, ah, okay, that's a fish crow. So I figure when they hear one, there were probably two or three or four who weren't talking. All right, let's see. 
I hope that we aren't seeing your screen became okay. Um, can I compare crows to the African gray parrot? Yeah, it's a really interesting issue. Um, the birds are so different in the way they communicate with each other. I think parrots, um, parrots and crows actually learn, modify their vocalizations with experience with others. One of the things that my student Andrea has discovered is that um, the Mariana crows, the pairs sound more similar to each other than they sound to their families of origin. You know, people always say, you know, you, you begin to sound like your husband or wife or partner. Well, apparently crows do too. Um, but African gray parrots are longer lived. They also live in really complex societies. I don't wanna be in the position of saying something flippant like, oh, one is smarter than the other or not. But they have the kind of intelligence that's adapted to the kinds of problems they have to solve. And, Amer and the African gray parrots have large ranges. They eat fruit, which comes and goes here and there. So their spatial abilities are great. Um, they're very primate-like. If you wanna ask more specific comparisons, I can, it's, but they're definitely, a long time ago, we would have said, well, the parrots are kind of like the primates and the crows are kind of like the wolves and dogs. And I think that's a little simplistic, but it's not entirely wrong. Yeah, 30,000 crows in the crow roost in Rochester. I think our Auburn roost is back up to about 60,000, 65,000 now, comes and goes. How is the COVID, COVID, COVID pandemic? <clears throat> uh, it caused a lot of slips of the tongue early on is what it did, um, affected how the crows survived in cities. Um, I think people were home a lot and put food out in their backyards if the crows were right around. So it was a little bit like bird feeders. Um, and the dumps didn't shut down. What did happen locally in Ithaca was that all the students at Cornell went home in, you know, at, at some point in 2020 when everybody went online and the uh, cafeterias shut down. And that was one of the things that used to is regularly dumped at the Cornell composting facility, which is Crow Central. So um, that was a big disappointment to them. I mean, it always goes down in summer. It's always lower in summer, but it definitely affected their use of that facility. Uh, rats in the cities proliferated, yeah. Um, how much, how can we be confident that change in mobbing frequency is systematic rather than random noise? Um, well, it's, it's not all that random in the sense that we do have 30 years of data. So um, we can, you know, show that I, I divided those time blocks at the time just up into five segments. I didn't, you know, however long they were. Um, and so we, we can't say that we have, you know, you never have enough data, but it's pretty good given that we make like 40 or 50 climbs a year. So there's a lot of trees climbed over 30 years. And so the number of crows at each event, um, the threat of other predators does change. It changes in the cities with the advent of more and more red-tailed hawks. That's, that was my trying to be my message. Red-tailed hawks, there is not a crow nest that I know of this year that is not within a few blocks of a red-tailed hawk nest. They're all over. And, you know, so it'd be interesting to look at cities that are more downtownish and maybe have fewer hawks still. Um, fish crows are definitely 
Yeah, Donna, fish crows are moving out. They haven't gotten out to my house. I live outside Ithaca, northeast of Ithaca. They're not there yet. I'm listening for them every day. Blue jays and crows. Blue jays do not like crows. Blue jays are faster to get peanuts than crows and will take the peanuts before the crows get them, which the crows always have to figure out. And yes, they will take the peanuts. Um, and But yesterday I watched a blue jay just ripping into a crow that actually was just, I, I knew where that crow was going. Um, and it was sort of, but the jay had a nest. So jays think crows take jay nests. Jays are responsible for more songbird predation than crows, crows are, but jays don't trust crows because they're bigger predators. So it's just sort of a hierarchy and crows hate ravens because they're bigger than crows are. So um, I don't know how symbiotic they are, but I think that the, the um, jays will, and crows are certainly aware of each other's calls. If anybody has an audio recorder and records either a jay or a crow, speed the crow up or the jay down and see if it doesn't sound like the other species. Jay's, J is just ka or vice versa. Okay. Does anybody want to yell out a question? Oh, somebody noticed two blackbirds harassing a crow. Okay, I fess up. I used to study red-winged blackbirds and just before I joined Kevin, I was aware of his work, which was going on in some of the same areas. And I hated crows then. Crows find an air, uh, a marsh where the red wings have got their nests and they're fairly synchronous and starting. And they love to eat red winged blackbird eggs and baby red winged blackbirds. I've watched individual crows go in and just hunt around. So blackbirds know what they're doing. Have to, have to admit. This might be our last year of banding crows because, because we're getting old, John. <laughs> um, finding climbers, it's, it's just, um, it's, a, it's a fairly, you know, these trees are many, many meters high. And so every single one is a risk to some climber and most of them are in white pines. And I don't have any more students. I'm not taking any more students on. I'm over 70, I'm 72. So um, I'm not you know, gonna try to be a um, 80 year old parent to a graduate student. Um, so we need to bow out. And I have huge amounts of data that we still haven't worked up and published and got organized. But I would love to, you know, here, I always love to hear more from people's observations. Um, we're, we're really short. It's hard, it's hard to study crows. They're so mobile. And we get, you know, we get these little windows of things that happen. I can tell you what's been happening the last few weeks and it's a bunch of stories. So any more questions? We're pushing the time. Great, anybody's happy, I would be happy to receive some really good, um, interesting odd crow observations. I will just say, if you have a backyard group and watch them carefully, if they're not banded, you can't absolutely swear to it, but it's true, you can get to know individuals pretty well. And one cue is always, of course, how they react to you. Um, and uh, it's, there are observations to be made. And that's one of the reasons I recommended June Hunter's book. She's, you know, as I say, she watches these crows really carefully. She only watches a few groups and she sees much more in that Vancouver house of hers than, than I see touring around and trying to keep crabs on 30 families. 
I'm looking forward to it. Let's see, somebody just said, uh, Cassandra just said, we noticed crows that would protect a feeding station we'd set up and protecting other birds from hawks. I think we have to be careful. I mean, they, they, they hate hawks. So a crow at a feeding station might be good protection for the other birds from hawks, even without the hawks meaning to protect the other birds. And we do see instances of things like that. You know that, um, injured animals in some areas of, of Central and South America, like injured um, jaguar, have been seen to hang out along trail, human trails and things where other animals would avoid them, avoid the trails. And we're not trying to protect them with our trails, but they're using the protection of our trails, if I can put it that way. Yes, Christmas count data is wonderful. Um, I think somebody said it was 30,000 at the Rochester roost. That's what was in the chat. Crow squirrel interactions, just to challenge you, are some of the most interesting things that I can think of. We've got the urban squirrels and the urban crows and I will swear, if anybody was able to do it, I'll bet we would find that crow, individual crows and individual squirrels in some cases recognize each other. Um, I've asked several grad, I've suggested to several graduate students, wouldn't that be a good project? No one's taken me up on it. It would uh, it'd be challenging. You'd have to learn to recognize a squirrel or figure out a way to market inadvertently, but um, squirrel crow interactions have got to be very, very interesting. Two competitors, very smart competitors. All right. I don't want to keep everybody forever. I'm happy to answer more questions. Oh, my crows, Cassandra asks if I think my study crows are aware that you're observing them. Yes, but what they do is they do train me in that inadvertent way that students can train teachers. And I will, I always tell the story of, first of all, they have a food call and it's a sharp call that's somewhat similar, but acoustically statistically distinctive from the alarm call. And they use it. When we aren't looking at them, we've paused, we're not seeing them. I'm sitting and I use my car as a blind often, so I'm not seeing them and I'll hear, ah, ca. It's like, oh, wait a minute, who's out there? And I can locate it, or if I have to throw peanuts out the car and then back the car up and then the crow's right down. So at one point I was trying to um, see where my oldest crow, MP, was, was building her nest. And um, she was very, she's, she was always reluctant. To, you know, she was always very careful. If she thought we were watching, she wasn't going to complete her nest. She wasn't going to fly to her nest. She would just stop, drop the stick. So she was doing that. I thought, great, I'm just sitting here. It's so quiet and everything. And then I hear, ca, ca, right up to my right. And it's her yearling kid who knew, knew my car and knew me and loved peanuts. And I had not been paying attention. And it was like, <laughs> peanuts. And she looked around, MP looked around, was like, saw the car, dropped the stick. It's all over. <laughs> so they do, they do direct you, they do teach you. All right, we could go on and on. So I'm not quite sure if I'm keeping people here who don't want to be kept or um, I'm following the... Yeah, Anna Stunkel mentions pulling tails. My uh, colleague, Kevin McGowan, who has more better pictures than I do, um, has some wonderful short video of a, a young crow pulling the tails 
of a vulture of a young vulture a baby vulture out at the compost the poor little vulture is just like completely confused All right, I think people need to take care. Thank you, Ann, this was so interesting. Well, I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. I, I loved giving it. And um, if you're, some of you who live near me in Ithaca, I know some of the folks, um, but if you're down this way, you know, you can, you can share my email if people want to get in touch. I don't have one of these cool blogs where you can give me cool observations at some point. If I do, I'll let you know. Um, but I always love to hear emails from people. And you might see one of our marked crows. You never know. Okay, everyone. Thanks for attending. And thank you again, Ian. Yep. Okay, good night, everyone. Have a good night. Good Bye -bye. night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>